Hi, welcome uh, to my presentation for the module of Sports Business and Strategic Thinking. Um, the purpose of this presentation today is to compare the delivery practices of sport in the United Kingdom and compare those to different policies in America. I'm going to analyse a contemporary issue of talent development in sport and compare it to the policies in America. I'm going to critically evaluate policies and systems that are currently in place in both countries and I will I finally conclude uh, on what I've talked about in this presentation. So just a brief history really, this was a study done by Pot and Van Hilverder in um, 2013 and essentially this study was done on Dutch sport and American but I believe because the UK is in is based in Europe I believe that similar approach would have been would have been used. So uh, essentially sport uh, in European countries started as a way of compensating for sedentary behaviour in classes. Uh, in comparison to America really, um, students started performing uh, extracurricular activities but due to behavioural issues these had to come under the supervision of the school. Uh, since then really what's happened is um, there's been a strong emphasis on performance and achievement within schools and this is something that has developed over the years and is, is still a fundamental part of sport in schools in America right now. Um, so just a brief overview really of sport in the UK, um, the DDCMS is, is currently the governing um, the governmental department for sport and through uh, lottery funding uh, they fund organisations like UK Sport and Sport England. So the role of UK Sport is essentially to um, develop elite athletes within the UK and try and, try and win as many medals as possible throughout uh, competitions such as the Olympics and so on. Uh, Sport England have, have a specific focus on grassroots and uh, develop uh, participation as well and in increase those participation levels in the country. Uh, Sport England and UK Sport will follow policies that are essentially set by uh, the central government. Uh, and as you can see in this slide, um, there have been a number of policies really throughout the, throughout the years. Uh, I want to focus on this one which is a, a new strategy for an active nation. Essentially this strategy was set out uh, in 2015 by the government in order to uh, increase participation in the country. As you might be aware, the, um, a, a current issue with the NHS really is the demand um, that is, uh, is currently, you know, the, the amount of people that are going into the NHS with illness and sickness and as a consequence the NHS is strug uh, struggling with these. Essentially this policy really, what is set out is, is to increase participation level to, to try and decrease that, um, that demand and, and how many people actually fall sick. Um, obesity is, is a real issue in, in the UK, I think over 63% of, of males are obese. So essentially this, this strategy has been set out to try and decrease those levels and really ta um, tackle the problem from, from its origin. Um, the strategy also, also focus, uh, focuses on increasing participation with, with less economically well groups. So people who have, who, who have less, less money and can't afford gym memberships and afford to uh, hire out pitches and, and participate in sport. This is, this is a current aim as well to increase um, participation with, within those groups. Uh, currently the, the less, well -off um, less well off people are the ones that are less participating in sport so that's why the, the, that strategy is, has been set. Uh, the strategy also really sets is trying to increase participation within uh, women and children. Uh, so how does the uh, US compare? So there's no governmental department in the US for sport. Um, sport is purely privatised in America and essentially gov um, athletes don't receive any funding from the government so they heavily rely on sponsorships from private companies to, to try and fund their careers. Um, college sport is funded through broadcast deals um, and sponsorships as well. So what happens is because there's such a high demand for sport um, at college level, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's been something that has uh, happened since, since sport really started. Um, that demand has, uh, means that uh, broadcasters can, can broadcast games and essentially there will be a, a large audience watching these. So there's, there's a demand for that and as a consequence colleges can, can 
um, make, make revenue out, out of these broadcast deals and sponsorship deals as well. Uh, also, professional sport is run through franchises. So, uh, as again, as I mentioned, uh, sport is purely privatized and all sports clubs are, are franchises within the, within the US. Um, so this is just a brief overview of the American system. So any uh, young player, student who will, who will start playing uh, sport at a young age, once they get to a certain age, they will, uh, they will get a scholarship to go into college or university. Um, there are three different divisions within, within college and university. So you have Division 1, Division 2 and Division 3. Uh, division 1 is the best and Division 3 is the worst. Uh, what also happens is Division 1 will get the best broadcast deals and as a consequence will be the, they will be, these will be the best colleges and, um, and, that, and yeah, make the most revenue through, through, um, through sport. Uh, further on, once these, these students have completed their degree there will be a draft system. So professional teams will draft uh, college students, the ones that they believe are the best. They will draft them on uh, to their team. Once players are professional, they're different farm teams, so these might be in a different league, for instance, and these uh, players can get experience by going out on loan to these farm teams. Uh, football in the UK. So the world governing body for football is FIFA, who uh, control competitions such as the World Cup and essentially control all the rules and regulations within football. Uh, you then have UEFA. UEFA control... Uh, competitions such as the Champions League. On a national level you have the FA, so the FA look after football from grassroots and elite football uh, within the UK. They will implement sanctions and fines and, th and, and things like that uh, within the country. You then have the various leagues, uh, clubs, within clubs you have a first team, an academy level and uh, starting right at the bottom you have schools and football and the community schemes. Essentially what is currently happening with the football, football and the community schemes is that uh, teams are trying to, to brand themselves and, and, and expose their brand. So they're trying to get into the kids at a young age, uh, expose the clubs and hopefully through this way increase uh, uh, their fan base and also try and sell merchandise essentially. Uh, another thing that they do through the football and community schemes is um, they try and spot players at a, at a young age. So if if players participate for, for instance, Manchester United football in the community, the coaches can that way um, look at the player on a, on a regular basis and if he is good enough, they can then forward in, him onto the academy. And another thing is, is clubs really want to be seen as ethical and trying to help out the community, which in, in modern business, there's a, there's a corporate social responsibility for, for the big businesses to do something like that. Um, here on, this is the public side, so you have county FAs again on, on a regional level, they will control um, local football and more grassroots. Uh, charities such as the Football Foundation and you also have the PFA who uh, look after support for players in an educational way, in a, uh, if players come down with injury for instance. On this side is the private sector, so you have terrestrial broadcasters such as Sky and BT who invest a lot of money into competitions. Um, you also have gambling companies such as William Hill who sponsor teams and make a lot of money through uh, people who gamble in sport. Uh, you then also have sponsors for, for instance, stadium uh, people, uh, companies who have stadium naming rights or sponsor the t-shirts of, of the team. And essentially this model was based on, on a model done by Beach and Chadwick which uh, I have just expanded and I believe it's currently um, how football is on a basic level in the UK. Uh, further on, football in the US. So, in the US, there's no promotional relegation system within the leagues. Again, as I mentioned, they are franchises, so the leagues are organizations. All professional sports leagues in America feature territorial agreements. Uh, essentially, what this means is that when a team or a franchise wants to join the league, the league will evaluate whether this team is able to be run as a monopoly in that in that city so what happens is um, for instance if you have the New York City Red Bulls and the New York C uh, New York City Football Club um, although these teams are both based in, in New York 
they will both have a, a territorial agreement. And the reason um, the league essentially wants to wants to create monopolies in, in certain states is because um, because they can essentially because they are exempt from the antitrust law. So the antitrust law stops regular businesses in in the U.S. being run as as monopolies. But what the league wants to try and achieve because they they are an organisation of their own. Essentially, they're trying to achieve that a club that is based in one city can attract all the fans and make the most money that way. Um, the other thing is uh, players enter via a draft system, which I mentioned earlier. Um, although they can be transferred from abroad, yet there's quite there's quite strict rules and regulations in place for this. Uh, teams are controlled by the league, and revenues are spread amongst the teams. So all the profits the teams make go to the league, and these are then spread out throughout the teams. And players' contracts are with the league, and therefore no transfer fees exist. So if a player is a free agent, he runs out of contract, he's free to move. Yet uh, a team can't go actually go and, and pay a transfer fee for, for a player because he is essentially owned by the league. Um, now, this is, this is a very commercial league as well, and essentially what the way owners make money is by... Uh, they buy a franchise for a certain amount, they try and then um, increase the value of the franchise which essentially is the league, and then later on they go on to sell that franchise for, for a lot more money. So in recent years, uh, the money, the value of franchises has gone has gone has significantly gone up. Uh, so this is just a brief way uh, development pathway of, of young players. But uh, I just wanted to focus on in in, uh, in two thousand and seven there was a new soccer development academy developed in the US, and essentially they tried to adopt a more European model bringing players through. Uh, essentially what this was was a league which was the highest league for, 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 young, for young players to play at. And um, this was a model developed by US Soccer and essentially they were trying to develop world class players from a young age. Now the, the system has actually come up under, under some cr uh, scrutiny for, for the amount of travelling that kids have to do at a young age. But it does, it does actually offer um, kids a way of, of, of improving their, their skills and they train regularly throughout the week and they are actually then seen by colleges uh, whether they, they can actually then go on to receive a scholarship because they are seen on a regular basis. Uh, moving on to specifically on the issue of player development, um, these here are just some internal recruitment figures for the Premier League. Um, this is some research done by Polly Ravner on Besson in 2016 and Essentially, the figures, as you can see, are, are really low. Uh, actually, six teams currently have a 0%, or in 2016, had a 0% internal recruitment rate, which is really is, a, is an alarming figure. Uh, some more stats here, really. So, in the UK, 98% of players that are given a scholarship at 16 are no longer in the top five, five tiers by the age of 18. Only 8 out of 400 players given a professional Premier League contract at 18 remain at the highest level by the time of their 22nd birthday. And there's a success rate of 0.012% uh, of players that actually go on to play uh, at a Premier League level at any given time. Uh, further on, this, just, this is just a European on the European scale, but this just shows you the, the amount of teams where over 50% accounted for half of the squad. As you can see the only team here is Atletico Bilbao um, who actually have a strong political view on this which is why they're actually the only, the only team. The Premier League currently has the lowest internal recruitment figures out of the top leagues and as you can see since 2009 there's been a steady decrease of um, the percentage of club trained players in, in all European zones. Uh, in America uh, stats are similar so, from high school that go on to play at college level, only 5.6% of uh, actual football participants. And further on, for, uh, the number of players that go on to play from a, from a college level to pro is currently at 1.4%. So as you can see, there's, there's 24,803 participants. This is at, at high school, at college level, sorry. And there were only 81 draft slots. So, this shows you that again there's a, there's a major issue with this. So why does this happen and what are the consequences? 
So this was just a, a quote by Slack in 2014, and essentially he says, some professional sports teams are also owned, owned by wealthy business people. Some are owned by corporations such as Red Bull and Disney. Consequent, consequently, their emphasis is not so much on sporting prowess, that is the winning of games, but on the return of inve on investments for shareholders. So essentially what you're saying is that teams are some in it to make money. So the commercialization of football. So this is a model, uh, again, by Beach and Chadwick in 2014. And I just want to sh highlight the, 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 the interaction between stakeholders in football. Essentially what the commercialization of football has done is it's created strong financial bonds. So I want to highlight the bond between supporters and the minor clubs. Essentially what happens is if a club starts losing, um, supporters stop turning up to a certain extent. This then puts financial pressure on teams and, and as a consequence then the manager might get sacked and a, new ma and a new manager might be brought in. The new manager will then have a focus on winning games and essentially that um, spotting talent and looking, looking over the academy is something that is, is completely overlooked. Uh, so this is just one of the ways that the fin that financial pressure of commercialization has, has impacted uh, youth development. So this is just something I want you to keep in mind for, for in a minute. Um, so this, this is research done by Brown and Portrack in 2009 and goes to say that despite the low success rate, players would routinely sacrifice social and educational aspects of their lives in order to become footballers. Um, research also suggests that players who make, fail to make a career uh, are actually at risk of experiencing psychological issues. Um, so one of, the, one of the problems is the current policies and structures in place. So just here, uh, athletic identity refers to the degree of which an individual um, relates to, to, his, to the role of being an athlete essentially. And, um, it has been suggested here in 2014 by Mitchell et al that um, the current new, uh, system that's been the Elite Player Performance Plan, which was a, a plan implemented by the FA in 2012, which uh, actually aimed to increase training hours and uh, start participation at a younger age, uh, because this issue of, of talent development. Um, so essentially what, what um, Mitchell et al is saying is that players who, who now take part in the EPP plan um, are at risk of developing an overly strong athletic identity or foreclosure by the age of 18. So essentially they are um, just relating to the identity of being an athlete, sacrificing other identities, and are also making a commitment to a career prematurely. And this is really despite the, the, the stats that I've just showed you um, and how low they actually are within in, in the UK and in America as well, really. But this obviously just applies to, to the UK. Um, so again, uh, Cassidy, Jones and Protrack here uh, quoted, an individual's athletic identity can be influenced by his or her interaction with a, a number of significant factors which could be family, friends, coaches, teachers and peers, in addition to what's been seen on social media and broadcasted. Uh, so essentially really what, what I'm trying to say here is that um, kids are being influenced um, by what they see on social media, on TV, on a day-to-day -day basis. and. They're submerging themselves in this career uh, of being a footballer, yet most of them won't go, won't, won't go on to make it. Um, research by Burke in 2003 showed that 41% of Irish footballers' career choice was influenced by their father's love of the game and 14% was influenced by their mother. So again, these kids might be starting to participate in the game um, because their father actually wants them to or because they, because they just, or because of their mother not necessarily because they actually want to want to play. So this just raises the questions, are kids playing because they enjoy it or are they playing because they see what they see on the TV, on, on, on the media, on the glamorous lifestyle, uh, which is portrayed to them on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, this, this is part of the commercialization of, of football and what's been um, happening on social media and on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, now, further research by Mitchell uh, et al. in 2014 found that players in their first year of their football scholarship showed higher levels of athletic identity. Now, this is a real issue because, um, this, the, although this could be really because players are coming out of high school and they're going on to play at, um, at football and they're excited to do so, 
the second year in their, in their scholarship is when crunch time comes and essentially they are given a professional contract and decisions are made. So some research by Horton and Mack actually found a correlation between athletic identity and marathon times. So what, what is being suggested here is that players are actually, I believe that players might be performing um, um, less well in their second, second year scholarship than in the first, which is, which is an issue because again, as I mentioned, they are, their decisions are made on their, on their contracts. So some factors might be used uh, to explain this. So the increased pressure of actually coming to the end of their contract, uh, the realization that a, a low number of them are actually going to go on and, and become a professional footballer, um, or burnout due to increased training. So as we, as I just mentioned, the EPP plan, um, sorry, the EP, EPP plan yet, yeah, which has just been uh, which has been since there since two thousand and twelve, and the the increased that number of hours of training is actually tiring these players psychologically and physically and as a consequence they are performing um, less well in their second year scholarship. All players just find that their occupation has become a job and it's no longer just a game. So again, as I mentioned in the first year they're coming out of, out of school and they're, they're excited to go into football but they realise the pressures that are put upon them and they don't actually... Um, Actually, what, what, they're, what they're experiencing is not what they've seen on social media and what they believe football is actually like. So this is just uh, um, actually comparing to German football, but I thought it would be important to raise it. So James in 2013 um, found that German players um, do 34 hours of education a week. In comparison, UK academy players only do 9 hours a week. And um, this is uh, Christian Streich, the SC Freiburg manager, who, who quoted in 2013, We can't let players choose one or the other. It's wrong. Most players in our academy can't be professionals. They will have to, they will have to look for a job. The school is the most important thing. And then comes the football. And this is, of course, not an approach that is being used in the UK. Again, as that, the, the EPP plan focuses, um, focuses on developing skills and talent. It doesn't it focus on developing their educational aspect um, and, try on, and their life after football. So some systems and policies in the US. So there's, there's a mixture of research done in this front, but um, I was going to highlight um, Wolverton's 2006 study, which suggests that the pressure of being an American student athlete is often compounded by time management problems in absence of campus, which uh, then leads on to emotional pressure and as a consequence the abuse of alcohol. So again the US system and policy isn't um, perfect yet I believe that when players go on to um, study at college level and perform at football they're developing other identities uh, as well as their footballing skills. So currently in the UK players are doing a BTEC in sport from 16 to 18 uh, which I believe is just currently um, further on relating their athletic identity. In comparison, uh, whilst this is at college level, so 18 to further on, uh, these players are actually um, going on to study things that they want. They have the option to study, for example, criminology if they would like, uh, something that in the UK players aren't currently able to do. So what is being done about this? So. Um, Double Pass is a company that has previously worked with uh, Germany and Belgium and now both the FA and um, US Soccer have both hired this company. Essentially what the company does is it tries to uh, measure clubs on, on, these, on the number of factors but um, yeah, essentially they, they, they look at the strategic and financial planning, the organisational structure and decision making, talent identification and development support staff including medical, social and educational, technical staff, facilities, productivity of the club and internal external communication. But is it enough? Is it really enough and has anything changed? So these, these both, um, both countries have had these, uh, this, this, um, hired this company for a, for a while now and to be honest no significant uh, structures or policies have actually changed within, within either country. However, as I mentioned, my main focus really is on in the UK, uh, where I believe that the major issue with talent development actually lies. 
So just to conclude, Woods Corain and Buckley um, suggest that the enforced deselection can leave aspiring young athletes with the inability to rely on other underdeveloped identities. So again, as I mentioned, players are coming through the academies and they are only relating to this identity in, in, in sport. They are not actually focusing on other social aspects. Um, players are also at risk of uh, experiencing psychological issues, as uh, researchers found. And the commercialization of the game is decreasing the chances of kids coming through the academies. And essentially what I'm trying to say is that an alteration of the educational program in the UK is important. The commercialization of the game is currently really increasing the demand for, for the game, yet that means essentially that not everyone, not every player will be able to go on to play at professional level. That, that's a given. However, the important thing is to give these players the best opportunity to go on to be successful in other things. So I personally believe that education is, is the most important factor and that is something that has to be emphasised. And it's also a, an issue really that the FA need to, need to focus, in, focus on. As such, I believe that the, the EPP plan needs to, needs to change and it needs to have a, a lot more of a focus on, um, on the educational side of football. Hope you enjoyed that and um, thanks for listening.